Intertrochanteric femur fractures. This is from the OTA Core Curriculum Resident Lecture Series, version 5. Slides are by Dr. Michael Blankstein, and I'm Saqib Rahman narrating. We already talked about uh, the first video in which we went over the concepts of stable and unstable fracture patterns. Uh, we talked a little bit about classification. Um, now we're going to shift gears a little bit, talk about nail versus plate, and... Um, Let's get started. So certainly there's been a trend uh, to seeing less use of the sliding hip screw over time. This is a study actually from the American Board of Orthopedic Surgery. So in this study, they're really looking at um, uh, new diplomats uh, who are applying for board certification coming out of, um, uh, out of their training. And um, what they're seeing is that they're just using a lot more nails, right? Um, this is a survey distributed to active AAOS members, uh, also showing that there is a preference now for more nails than sliding hip screws. This is a paper from 2015. Um, so there are some theoretical advantages, uh, mechanical advantages. It's a load sharing device. It provides an intramedullary buttress, and we're going to demonstrate this uh, or show this in it's a few slides later. So it helps to resist excessive fracture collapse. Uh, and the nail is a little bit more centrally located to the axis of weight bearing uh, than a sliding hip screw. So what about uh, prospective randomized data? This is from the Canadian Orthopedic Trauma Society looking at sliding hip screw versus um, cephalomedullary nails. And honestly, no significant differences noted uh, with functional outcomes. Now, radiographically, the intramedullary devices led to better radiographic outcomes for reasons that we'll be talking about, but in this study did not translate to improved functional outcomes. And a lot of studies of sliding hip screw versus nails for intertrochanteric femur fractures have uh, shown similar uh, findings. That said, we're going to talk about a lot of the issues that can lead to mechanical instability, such as the lateral wall. So we'll show this in a few slides later. But if you have a fracture of the lateral wall and essentially have the equivalent of like a reverse obliquity or transverse type fracture pattern, uh, essentially, as a result of that, then sliding hip screw is not exactly designed uh, for that. So here you can see, you know, if there's a you know, fracture line, and you may not be able to see, if this fracture extends all the way here, you have, you know, intertrochanteric femur fracture, and you have the functional equivalent of this being incompetent, that lateral lateral wall here. So if this, if this is not preventing uh, excessive sliding, then you will end up with the fragment all the way out here, and you have this excessive shortening. I mean, the femoral head was probably something all the way out here, and it's shortened to here. Well, why is that? What's happening? Well, when this fracture shortens, there's no, I mean, normally if you just had a fracture line like this, it would come to here and stop. And this would resist sort of the fracture from displacing any further. And you'd get, you know, fracture healing and you wouldn't get excessive shortening. But if this backstop is not here and essentially this whole fragment can migrate, right, then when this shortens, it's just going to uncontrollably slide as shown in this in this figure so uh, with a nail for example the nail is not sitting on the side of the bone the nail is sitting something like this so when you get shortening it's going to only shorten up on, up until it hits the nail so the nail to some extent takes the place of that lateral wall so whether the lateral wall is competent or not it doesn't matter when you use a nail. It does matter when you use a sliding hip screw. So when you have reverse obliquity, the same phenomenon can happen. I mean, if you have a you know, sliding hip screw with a side plate, for example, this is going to allow for uncontrolled sliding in this direction, right? It's acting just like the last case. So these are often treated with intramedullary nails. And in this case, they talk about the long nail, but we'll talk a little bit later about you know long versus short. What about um, 
truck enteric stabilization plate. So if you are going to use a sliding hip screw for an unstable pattern where there's lateral wall incompetence, you can replace the lateral wall. Now this is an add-on device. This is the sliding hip screw and then on top of it, you can actually see here, there's a second plate on top of it. On top of it, you will add this sort of add-on plate that links to the sliding hip screw typically and provides that lateral wall buttress so that as this compresses, it's got a backstop. It's built in, or you have to put it in. Uh, and alternatively, you would use a nail, right? So in general, indications for cephalomedullary nailings are unstable fractures, right? So when you have a lateral wall fracture or big greater trochanteric fracture that extends all the way down, reverse obliquity, subtrochanteric extension. Um, so that's when you really want to think more about using intramedullary nail. Now, I do want to bring to your attention the uh, AAOS, um, AAOS guidelines. Um, Go to aaos.org and look up clinical practice guidelines. There's a relatively recent guideline for the management of hip fractures in the elderly, and you probably want to make sure that um, you are aware of these and to the extent possible that your center is able to support these uh, recommendations in your clinical pathways. Uh, these are they're also hip fracture management clinical guidelines in, in the UK. Um, Let's talk about uh, a, uh, a long nail. When do you use a long nail? Well, if you think that you need to protect the entire femoral shaft, um, if you have a fracture with diaphyseal extension, the disadvantage is a little bit increased cost, a little increased OR time, especially you know if you're putting in distal interlocking screws and you have to ream the whole canal. Um, you know, you have to take the time to do freehand distal locking. Uh, it's possible that if you don't have a nail that matches the bow, uh, that with these patients with osteoporotic bone, there's a risk sometimes to perforate anteriorly um, as the nail goes distally if you don't have the appropriate radius of curvature for the bone that you're dealing with. And that's another complication that can happen. Short nails, the advantages are a little easier to use. The distal locking bolt that goes through the insertion jig, you don't have to ream everything distally. A uh, little bit less expensive. Disadvantage is that with some of the older designs, you would get fractures at the end of the short nail. Um, these have been somewhat minimized with newer designs. So I talked a little bit about the radius of curvature. So modern nails have tried to minimize that sort of perforation of the anterior cortex distally by having a lower radius of curvature. Um, so it's more bowed. Remember, Smaller radius of curvature means that it's more bowed. Larger radius of curvature means it's more, it's less curved, right, or more straight. So modern nails have a little bit more of a curvature to prevent that um, anterior perforation. So long versus short nails. This uh, study looked at cost and complications of that. Um, 262 patients uh, treated with... Um, uh, for uh, A2 type fractures with short nails versus long nails, no significant difference, right? In complications, readmissions, failures, or deaths. That's for A2 fractures, which are common intertrook fractures that you'll see. Long versus short nails, um, incidence of ipsilateral fractures and costs with each implant. So in this particular study, uh, 171 short nails, 439 long nails, union rates equivalent. Uh, no differences in overall cost. Uh, just the locking does seem to help. It seems to protect against femur fractures and may affect fracture, the refracture location if it does occur uh, if you're using a long nail. So you may want to consider that. Another study, long versus short nail, randomized prospective study of 168 patients, comparable outcomes. In this study, did not see any implant failure or uh, fractures at the end of the implant or lag screw cutouts. So the question is, you know, how much subtrochanteric extension can you have and still do a short nail? And in this case, it said up to three centimeters subtroch extension was okay for a short nail. So what about basic cervical fractures? So basic cervical fractures are when you have fracture the base of the femoral neck um, exiting just above the lesser trochanter. 
Uh, so we talked about in another lecture how you can treat these with um, sliding hip screws, sometimes with a derotational screw. But you can use, um, you can consider uh, cephalomedullary fixation. But in this particular study, six out of eleven had failure fixation, unacceptable tip apex distance. Um, so you do have to think that um, uh, that's not what you want to uh, have if you're going to fix these. You have to make sure you have acceptable tip apex distance. And they suggested that um, cephalomedullary nailing may not be adequate fixation for this fracture pattern. Um, despite our best efforts, screw cutout is still a problem. So how do you minimize this? Well, minimize your tip apex distance uh, in some series it's up to 15%. Is it an implant problem? Is it a technique problem? Is it a bone problem? Well, when you have poor bone, it's more likely to happen. If you do poor technique, it's more likely to happen. Um, so you have to ask, how can we best achieve stable fixation in osteoporotic fractures? Well, Dr. Baumgartner's uh, data in 1995, JBJS, showed a principle that we still... Um, that still holds true in uh, modern surgery, which is minimizing your tip to apex distance on the combined uh, tip apex distance on both views. So that is the tip of the screw to the center of the femoral head on the AP and the lateral. And you add those up, should be less than 25 millimeters. If you can do that, your uh, risk of cutout drops off significantly. So... Um, that is something, whether you're doing cephalomedullary nails or sliding hip screws. I mean, that study was in sliding hip screws, but it it is a principle that um, uh, is relevant to many implants that we use. Uh, it is a predictor um, in intramedullary devices also for um, cutout. Um, so uh, that is something you want to uh, play close, pay close attention to. So... Um, in this particular biomechanical analysis, um, you may want to take a look at this in JOT uh, 2012. They concluded that um, if you are going to err, you can err a little bit inferiorly um, and with the, um, and this is, this is done with the cephalomedullary nail, um, certainly not superiorly. Um, but uh, if you are central on the lateral and a little inferior on the AP, that may be even more ideal for cephalomedullary nail. Predictors for failure for cephalomedullary nailing of proximal femur fractures. This is a retrospective review. Um, in this particular study, they showed that, again, slight inferior placement of the lag screw is preferable to reduce the rate of cut out when you're doing nailing. So center center position is generally advisable for um, sliding hip screws. If you have to err, I would err a little bit inferiorly if you're doing a cephalomedullary nail. Okay, so we're going to pick up with the rest of the slides in the last uh, portion of this uh, slide deck in the third video. We're going to talk about a lot of uh, alternative uh, devices other than just the lag screw. Thanks.